series of distinguished lectures, public programs, and community conversations. These sessions at the Clinton School hopefully enhance the educational and community experience by bringing guests from our city, our state, our country, and our world here. Today's event and gathering could not be uh, more timely. And I might add that this is the largest crowd with the shortest advance notice that we have had. Before I introduce one, uh, let me welcome both Harriet and John Stevens who are here. You all stand up and be ready now. John is a student at the University of Pennsylvania, and I've been back there telling him he needs to take David Eisenhower's class. Our speaker today, the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Stephen E. Warren Stevens, Civic, Charitable, Educational, and Business Endeavors are second to none in this city and this state. And his record is incredible and continues to be incredible he and his family do for others. Ladies and gentlemen, a more timely day could not take place as we talk about the challenges and opportunities facing our city and our state with one of our state's best and brightest. Ladies and gentlemen, Warren Stevens. Funds. 
Um, but they're shareholders. They are interested in maximizing the value for the shareholders, which is very, as opposed to public shareholders, is you know, a much smaller group. But it's the same, and they're going to run the business with an eye towards improving the business, growing the business. You know, nobody, nobody buys a business to let it stagnate or sit still. They buy it to grow. And, and from what I know of both of these groups, that's, that is their intention with both of these companies. And they're going to need, if not all, a substantial portion of the existing management teams at both companies to do just that. Uh, they don't. They don't know how to run these businesses. Uh, you know, most of you know, or maybe you don't know. Stevens has been in the private equity business for some 50 years, and whenever we have to get involved in the management of a company we've invested in, that's a failure. We like to think we invest in good management teams. Uh, if we have to bring in our own management team, well, you know, we made a mistake. We're not geared to do that, and for the most part, neither neither of these firms. Now, I'm not saying there won't be some management turnover, because there will be. Um, some of the some of the management teams are not going to want to continue to work for the for the company, and it could range from reasons of, of uh, I don't like them to you know I've done it long enough. Uh, a lot of these people have been working at these businesses an awfully long time, so it would be very <clears throat> be very normal for them to say at this point in their life, at this point in their you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna retire, and I'm gonna go do something else. And that something else can be a great thing. You know, that that can spawn new businesses and new companies. You know, when you know the headlines that you read about layoffs at big companies around the country. You know, General Motors laying off a couple of thousand people. But the jobless claims keep going down. Why is that? It's because tons of smaller businesses are filling the gap. And when you look at the growth in employment in this country, that's what has driven the employment numbers. It's not big companies. You know, and, and so as a, as a community, we shouldn't be afraid of these two proposed transactions. Because if, from an employment standpoint, they're, they're fine. Now, there's always, always something out there like a uh, so-called strategic buyer, another firm that's in the same business. Now, that's a different deal. If, if, if Verizon were to buy Altel, there wouldn't be many jobs left in a little while, would be my guess. There'd be some, but that wouldn't, you know, because they have the infrastructure, they have the jobs, this duplication there. Um, um, that's part of the reason they make the acquisition, but so far none of those companies have shown up and they haven't shown up in the case of accident. That's not to say they won't. They could, they might in a few months, they might in a few years, they might never show up. But, we as a community cannot say that, or, or cannot feel like that we're not going to be economically vibrant if, if Axiom and, and uh, Altel are in fact sold to, to some of the strategic buyers that are, that are larger than they are. We as a community have to be able to adapt, and the people that are no longer employed at those companies will, will want to come out and start businesses, and, and start something successful, and, and, and they will have resources to do that. Um, you know, they'll, they will have made money in these transactions, and the stockholders of all of these companies will have additional money to, to invest in businesses or things that they want to do, and for the most part, they're all going to want to, do, want to do them here in Central Arkansas. By the way, I say this over and over again, if I ever use the phrase Little Rock, I mean Central Arkansas. I always think of Little Rock as going from from Con Bluff almost to Cersei, so, and, and over to Conway, as far east as you want to go. So, uh, if I say Little Rock, I don't think I'm focused on this side, of, this side of the river. I think most of y'all have heard me say that before. But, there's been some things written about Alltel 
written and, and then um, in the uh, TV media. And I'd like to take a minute to, to address. Um, there were some, now y'all know I'm on the board of Altel. Uh, there, there's been some comments made that the process for picking the private equity firm that has been picked, private equity firms, the group, that that was somehow not on the up and up. And you never know how these things are going to, uh, how these things are going to play out in the media, but I can assure you, and, and the, the implication was somehow the management of Altel favored the group that has now been chosen. I've been around the investment banking business my whole life. Um, I've, I've been on the Altel board. I was trying to think. I can't remember how many years it's been. Uh, that is not true. The Altel management team ran as open and fair a process as has ever been run, in my view, and also the view of the, of the uh, counsel to the transaction, which is one of the largest M&A law firms in the country, Wachtell, Lipton, something in Pratt's. Uh, they, do, they do a ton of M&A deals, and their comment to us was, this is, the, this is the most fair process we have ever seen. And for that management team to, to take some shots about that is so unfair. Um, I, I, I just, it, it made me so mad uh, when I saw it because they, they really had done 180 degrees the opposite and, and surprise, surprise, you know, the, the complaints came from, from the groups that weren't selected. Imagine that. And they wanted to try to taint the process. Well, when all the facts come out, and, and I'm sure they will because there, you know, there have been some lawsuits filed, the record on that is going to be very impressive and, and, and as, as a board member, but just as a friend of the Fords and, and as an Arkansan, you would be very pleased at the way they handled it themselves. They absolutely put, the management team put their financial interests over here and set it aside and said, we're going to get the best deal we can for our stockholders. And then, if you decide, if we get that, then if you decide you want our management team, then we'll talk to you. I don't know what else anybody can do. Um, but I guess, you know, somebody somewhere is, is, is not going to be happy about, about something all the time. And, and I guess that's the case with, uh, with this. But, but like I said, when, when all the facts come out, the, the record's going to make you all proud. And, and I hate that the management team is going through that. There, you know, there's also in the, in the paper today, um, an article about Stevens and its role in, in invest or advising Altel on the transaction and some speculation as to whether we might have a conflict of interest. And, and it strikes me today in, in the world and in the media that one of the great things people can do is, is shout, well, there might be a conflict of interest. Oh, Lord. Might be a conflict of interest. Let's have a special investigation. Let's 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 figure that out. Uh, it's a terrible allegation. I'm not really sure what they're saying about Stevens having a conflict of uh, interest. The the you know the thing that you logically want to look for in a conflict of interest is is we somehow not on the side that we're representing. In this case, we're representing Altel and its stockholders. Well, we're one of the largest stockholders of Altel. And therefore, our representation, first of all, as a firm, we never, ever put our fees in front of the interests of the stockholders of the company that we're representing. Never. Never do that. Uh, it's just, it, it goes against our culture, it's not right, it's the wrong thing to do, you know, life's too short, we're not going to do that. Um, but to somehow allege that with the Alltel transaction where we own 10 million shares as a family, the 
defies any logic that what, what defies logic. There is no way to come up with how we could possibly have a conflict of interest if we were to receive a fee for advising Alltel on a transaction to benefit their shareholders, which we are the largest shareholder, uh, largest in, individual shareholder. I don't know about the largest shareholder. So, you know, actually this, there was a person in this article from some school, Kennesaw State, that actually gets it about right, that as long as no members of the board, no lawyers, and no investment bankers have relationships with the buyer's side in the years leading up to the transaction, it's probably okay if those developments change, however, it could be a very different story. Well, we've had no relationship with the buyers, and uh, probably never will. That's one of our charms, is we tend to work for companies and not the private equity firms that are, that are the buyers. Um, the only other thing I'd say about this article today is that somehow all the, the, the four of the management team worked at Stevens and that that could somehow be a conflict of interest. Okay, I'm open. Somebody explain that to me. Um, we're actually very proud of that. Um, we have managed, we have, uh, we call them Stevens alums. We have Stevens alums at Axion too. Uh, we have Stevens alums at a lot of companies that we work for. One of the reasons you know, we've worked so closely with Altel and Axiom and other companies is they trust us. They know how we think. Part of it has to do with they've worked with us. They know, they know us. You know, how many people do you trust that you don't know? Uh, probably zero, I hope. Uh, but, you know, knowing someone, knowing their culture, knowing their background, uh, yes, that makes for closer ties. Uh, we're very proud of, of, of the former Stevens alums that, that are at Altel and, and all the other companies around. And uh, the fact that they worked with us, I can, for the life of me, I can't figure out how that could possibly, uh, possibly be a conflict. But I'm sure somebody will, will or has kind of brought that up. But that's, that's a possibility. But all these things are changed. Nobody likes change. Everybody. It's worried. Fears change a little bit. Um, but there are there are so many good things that are going on, and I think we need to focus on them as a community, um, as as to what's going to be the big economic drivers for us going forward. As as a, as a as central Arkansas. Um, other than, other than Walmart. Other than Walmart, there is not one public company in the state that is too big to be bought. Rumors about Dillard's last week. Rumors about J.B. Hunt, our fable office, called us up and said they heard J.B. Hunt is going to be bought by a private equity firm. I have no idea. But the money's out there to do it if somebody wants to do it. And so, as a, as a, you know, there isn't, there isn't a company other than Walmart that, that is too big to be to be bought by someone. But what do we have here in, in central Arkansas that can't be bought? Well, I'm not just saying this because I saw Jonathan Bates sitting in when I when I walked in. One of the things we have, and, and one of the greatest assets we have is the uh, University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences and Arkansas Children's Hospital. Um, there are 9,300 employees at UAMS. Their annual budget for 2008 is over a billion dollars. They have over a thousand physicians. Now, when we think about demographics, we always we all know the population is getting older, and people want to live in a community where they have access to great health care. And UAMS, Children's Hospital, and all of our hospitals, St. Vincent's, Baptist, all of them, are critical in providing that level of health care that people want and, and need to be near. And so when you, when you think about things that we can get behind as a community and, and, and grow, 
UMS, Gardens Off Children's Hospital, really comes to mind. And I, I've really said this privately for a long time, but I think that's going to be the driver economically of growth in, in Central Arkansas. So the more we can do to support UAMS and all and Children's Hospital and all the things they do, uh, it's gonna it's gonna pay it's gonna pay the bills for us in, in a big way. You know, one of the most overlooked assets, although it, it can't be sold, but there are risks with it. One of the, one of the most overlooked at, uh, assets, I feel like, Little Rock Air Force Base. Um, Little Rock Air Force Base has over 3,000 jobs and has a total estimated economic impact of $527 million every year on our economy. Um, you know, we always have the risk of base closures, but you know, so far we seem to be we seem to be handling that political uh, missile aimed at our base pretty well. And uh, um, you know, don't forget about you know, it's easy to forget the air base up in Jacksonville. I, I don't know that way very much, but. You know, when you stop and think about that kind of impact, we ought to have, we ought to pay a little more attention to it, and and, and find ways to support them and integrate them into the community. And then that's going to make that's going to make it harder for them at some point in Washington if they ever want to close that base to do that. It's important, and we ought to we ought to be focused on that. Um, I think. One of the best things going on in our community is is uh, the downtowns. I, I had to use plural, you know, two cities, but it's really one. It's downtown. Um, this weekend, you know, there was an article again in the paper, and they were complaining about there's going to be terrible parking problems with Riverfest and, and the Travelers playing at, at Dickie Stevens Park. Aren't we lucky? <laughs> Jeez, you know, okay, we got a parking problem. Hey, that's great news, isn't it? I mean, it is good news, isn't it? Um, I got these numbers uh, from the travelers that uh, their attendance today is 120,000 compared to 68,000 in the same period last year. And uh, concessions are up more than $200,000 compared to the last year of the field. It's good news. You know, really good news. Uh, I'm anxious to see, I saw uh, Bird Park last night at another function. I'm anxious to see how many people go to the game with Riverfest being here this weekend. And I think they're here this play last night. We've got five more, five more games in this homestand. And he laughed and he said, well, it's either going to be 10,000 or zero. And I said, it's going to be close, it's going to be closer to 10,000 than it is, than it is zero. Uh, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that the game Sunday starts a little early and it really is a good place to watch the fireworks show if you're, if you're sure. <laughs> Just a little, just a little plug. Um, you know, what else do we have that's a great asset? Um, you know, without being boastful about it, I, I hope you'll take this in, in the right, right way, I'm sure you will. Um, you know, really our firm, that's one that didn't go anywhere. We employ about 700 people. The problem with our firm is we don't employ enough. You know, we, we're not going to employ thousands of people um, to make up for somebody that moves. You know, if, if something happens or somebody moves. Um, but the fact is, um, we we have an awful lot of good people in our firm. They're bright, they're hardworking, and a lot of them go on and do other things like the all tell. Stevens alums and the Axiom Stevens alums. And I could point to a lot of other uh, Stevens alums that are out there, um, you know, being successful in business and, 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 and then being successful in life, you know. Uh, uh, you, you, you probably don't know this, uh, Dale Dawson, who's worked with our firm for years. Uh, I'm not really sure how this happened, but he has become uh, Mr. Rwanda. Dale Dawson, and now he's involved so many other people from our firm. They go to Rwanda on a regular basis. They're trying to help the economy. Uh, they're building schools. They're working with the, with the president. 
Um, you know, that's being successful in life. That's that's helping. That's that's helping things, and, and hardly anybody knows about that. Um, but we're we're just as proud of, of what Dale and that group of people are doing in Rwanda as as, as we are as what uh, other other people have done done in the business world. Uh, but you know. All tells, all tell an Axiom's future, even with these acquisitions, for the near term, is good for our for our local community. I, I think it's, it's bright as it's been, nothing's changed. They've changed public shareholders for private shareholders. In the case of all tell, they also got a whole lot more debt on them. Uh, and that may that may have an impact here, but uh, they won't be as flexible in terms of their capital expenditures. It may limit their growth a little bit, but the, the buyers have said they're not they're not going to let that happen. Um, I apologize again for anybody that came here wanting me to say something about the schools. Just yet. Uh, the only thing I'll say is if you'll run for the school board, we'll put you run again for the school board. We'll put you back up here. <laughs> uh, with that, I'm going to open it up for some questions. Uh, I, I don't know. Let's uh, let's wait till we get microphones. Let's get our people positioned so everybody can hear. Bob G and Nikolai have the microphones. Raise your hands, please, if you got a question. Right here, here we go. Good noon. In a relationship to economic impacts and effects on the city, we've been talking about just purchases of large companies here. We had the recent article on May 8th by the New York Times, which addressed an image they saw. How does that impact Little Rock in relationship to economic development and your ability, because you have connections in New York and here, and uh, how do we go about changing that for the benefit of the city and community and you? Well, I think that's an unfortunate article. Do you all know the article that's talking about in the New York Times? Um, I, I, think, uh, I think that headline and that story were and, and those things hurt. Um, years ago, I, I'm talking 20 some odd years ago, I was in Hong Kong and uh, met a guy who was, who, he knew where it was a business deal and we were from Little Rock and he said, uh, well, how are race relations in Little Rock? I looked at him, they're fine. What are you talking about? And he said, well, you, you had a lot of trouble a few years ago. A few years ago. I'm the same age. I'm 50. I just turned 50 in February. And, uh, and, and while we never, ever, ever want to forget what was what happened in 57, the bravery of the people in the fight for civil rights in the 50s and 60s, um, as a, as a community, I think we need to move on, and in a lot of respects, I think we have. Um, I, I, I wish somehow people like the New York Times didn't make it quite so simple. But you know, if you read if you read that article, it's really interesting to me. And anybody, that, and probably most people aren't thinking about it like I am because I'm from Little Rock, but they they pointed out there were four other southern cities. I remember a couple of them. New Orleans was one, and I think Memphis was another one. I can't remember. Birmingham was one. I can't remember the fourth. But the number, the number of white students in, the, in those public school systems in those cities was in single digits. And in the same part, they said, and in, and in Little Rock, it's 25 percent, or maybe more. I can't remember. 25 or 26 percent. That sends the right message. But you know, most people don't read past the headlines, and you know those things hurt. They just do. And I, you know, we have open disagreements, and we have to work through those. If somebody views those in one way from outside, I don't know if there's much we can do about that. Um, we just we just have to continue to to work through the issues. You know, the main issue is let's make the, let's make the school let's make the public school district as good as we can make it. And you, you know, I. I'm, I'm very involved in private education, but you know, private edu private education goes hand in hand with public education. You, 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 you know, 
does at the university and college level, they can at the K through 12. And maybe and they both ought to make each other better. But the, the school district is where the bulk of the students are. The public school district is where the bulk of the students are. And always will be. We we have to make we have to make the school district as good as we can. I don't know what you do about that, but I guarantee you it hurts. And you know, that's a good lesson for all of us. We don't think about that when we get in some of the issues, and I'm not talking about the school district, just any issue, but, but somebody picks up on something and they may misinterpret it or they may write about it in a way that's different than we're thinking about it. And they have ramifications beyond what we see as a local school district issue. Thank you. 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 Uh, any future use of theaters that you may have involved in where that may go? I'm going to future use of theaters that you may have. Yeah, I'm this. Oh, Lord. Uh, well, we have, uh, we, we've had great plans for the theater for years, and then I got involved in this golf course out west, and then I got involved in the Capitol Hotel. And um, it's on the drawing board. We have lots of discussions going on with people, but I, I would say in the next three years or so, we're going to we're going to come up with some plans, concrete plans to do something with uh, the old center theater, as what you're talking about, and, and and really all of that. We we own all of that block except the KTV TV building, and then there's a law firm that's there, and then we own across the street as well. Um, we're, we're, you know, everybody's got a plan that always involves me putting up money. So, <laughs> um, we're trying to find one that, that is a workable plan that maybe I don't put up quite so much money at all. <laughs> Other questions?
we can't depend on them staying here as their economies get better in their home countries. They're going to go back. Um, I think we have a tendency to view um, ourselves as, as impervious to some of the things you were talking about. You, you, you all probably don't pay that much attention to this, but, but I do in our business. But you know, last year uh, there were more initial public offerings outside of the U.S. than in the U.S. And one of the reasons for that is we have overdone it on regulation. And, and people don't want to be public. You know, one of the things, I don't actually know this number with Altel, uh, but they're, they're going to save tens of millions of dollars just by being a private company and not having to go through the regulatory filings that, that they have to do right now. A lot of money. And, and uh, we, we've overdone it and on, on the capital market side. And we've, we've got to face up to the fact that, you know, being a citizen of Bermuda and not paying any U.S. taxes is a perfectly legitimate alternative uh, to, to, to being here in the U.S. You have English law, you know, stable economy, nice play. I mean, it's, it's, it's perfectly fine, uh, you know, unless a hurricane can bear down on you. But I mean, it's, it's, uh, those are the kind of things we've got to face. And I don't know how you manage through that. I think so long as we have it, we have it so we reward people for taking risks and building businesses with ideas. Um, we're going we're to be okay. If, um, and, and part of that is you know, letting, letting people come into this country and, and, and take a shot at them. We don't need them you know, flooding here and not know who they are. You know, just have no control over that. But you know, open immigration is, is the saving grace of this country. If we didn't have the immigration that we have, we would have a declining population, like in, like Europe, like Japan. I mean, they're facing serious, serious crunches. Even China today's population growth has nosed over, and they're not they're not uh, they're not replacing their population. They got a long way to go. Um, they're not. Doing it. Here we got time for one more question. Right back here. Or with, the, with all the recent activity and the new growth in the downtown area, obviously we're really missing the Capitol Hotel. Uh, tell us a little bit about when we should be back in line with the Capitol. And know. what can we expect when the Capitol returns? It's going to be great. <laughs> uh, we're actually uh, shooting to be online September 1st. There was a, there was a little blur. Um, we, we actually started interviewing to hire people to restaff the hotel. We kept our management team. And uh, um, our senior management team, but but none of the staff. Uh, we have a new chef who I've been sampling some of his things, and they're fantastic. Um, but, but we're shooting for September first. Um, I, I I don't want to go into any, any specific details because we're going to try to make some PR splash when we open and have some pictures done. But I will tell you this: you know the lobby will look the same. Ashley's will look pretty much the same in the same place and pretty much the same. And of course the bar will still be there. And virtually everything else in that hotel, wiring, plumbing, air conditioning, um, anything you can think of and some things we probably had, windows, everything, the brand new. Um, it's, it's, been a, it's been a very long project, much longer than we thought. Um, but it, as long as we had it closed, we figured, well, and we actually probably could have done even a few more things, but we finally drew the line somewhere. Uh, but it is, it is going to be as fine a hotel as there is in this country. And it's going to be a boutique. We've, we've actually shrunk the number of rooms from 120 to 94. But the rooms are better, uh, bigger. The bathrooms are all redone. Um, uh, it, it, Actually, now when I walk through there, I can get, they're starting to put it back together instead of, you know, stuff tearing apart and throwing it out the back door. So that's encouraging to me that we're actually making progress. And, and, uh, but, but September 1st, that's, that's what Bob East and his, and his wonderful company have, have told us. And uh, uh, I think we're, we're going to make that. So it's, it's coming soon. Stand by for a little more, but be ready to go back when it, when it reopens. 
Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Mr. Stewart. Thank you all for coming. Uh, you have on your sheets the uh, list of our upcoming speakers. We hope you'll come back and we appreciate you being here. Have a good afternoon to be with you. Thanks.